So just kind of picking up from where we left off, uh, during the night of the first session I gave you guys a little bit of an intro, and uh, we're just going to read that here real quick, just to kind of set the stage for the rest of what we're going to talk about. We begin in an uneventful corner of the Tenebrian Empire's holdings, a small city on the edge of a glassy harbor. The city of Tideswallow is a place of upheaval and change. Once little more than a quiet fishing village of isolation-focused sailors, it was hardly the sort of area that would attract attention. Its harbor, protected from the rougher waters of the sea by the ruinous spires of the Fiendfall Reef less than a mile off the shoreline, brought in just enough of the ocean's bounty to keep the town alive, never enough for it to thrive. It was only with the news of the New World, a mysterious continent that seemed to appear entirely out of nowhere, that eyes began to fall upon the sleepy little fishing commune. Ships and passage to the strange new land were needed, and there were few spots better suited to the task of staging them than Tide Swallow. Almost overnight, the town became a central point of travel, then a center of trade as treasures and stories began to return from the lands beyond the sea. The town soon became a city, and the streets were suddenly filled with people from every corner of the Empire and beyond. People of every walk of life, all while the original citizens sat back and simply watched. Some growing filthy rich off the new commerce, others simply growing filthy as they were left in the dust of their town's sudden advancement into a new age. But it was an age short-lived. For now, only two years later, the town has been all but forgotten by the winds of fortune. Tide Swallow's passage to the New World quickly became less than desirable uh, for explorers and settlers. Quicker, safer, and cheaper paths across the sea were discovered far from the port city. The freshly constructed walls, towers, and docks soon fell into disrepair as the coin meant to be dedicated to maintenance dried up. Now, only the most desperate or foolish come to the city seeking passage to the New World. And that's about when you guys showed up. Yep. So, that just kind of paints a little bit of a picture of the setting. The whole general idea was just to make this one little sandbox of a city for you guys to essentially explore until enough weeks pass that we could actually have the regular campaign. Right. And just kind of, as time went on, it became clear that wasn't going to happen, so... I started focusing more on more of uh, just on actually turning it into the a real, yeah, a living, thriving place for you guys to explore and become a part of. Yeah. Uh, the original plan was just to drop the new world angle altogether, just because I didn't have the original DM's notes on it or anything, and I didn't really want to. Where you, you weren't comfortable either. Yeah, right? exactly. It wasn't my campaign. Yeah. But enough time's passed now that, based on the point you guys are at, it's time for you to actually make progress on that original goal. Yeah. So and you've spent a year in Tide Swallow, which has amounted to about three weeks, I think, of total time in game. Which is yeah. Just most of most of just the, rough. Most of that was done. Uh, yeah, see that was yeah weeks and weeks and weeks that were like three days in the game. I'm gonna see if I still have that calendar of uh, what happened in that first yeah, week oh, yeah, that lasted that. for yeah. six months. Yeah. So yeah, it was a few days or like a week or something. Yeah. For perspective, our <laughs> sessions were only ever like two and a half to three hours long, yeah. one day a week, and that was sometimes skipping weeks in between. Yeah. But uh, it still should have progressed further than the three to four weeks that it's been in game. No, I mean it happened organically. Yeah, it's, it's <laughs> nothing overstayed. It's it's welcome. No, it, it all flowed pretty well. It was just when we actually looked back at how much time had passed yeah. in game that it was like, oh, we've only known each other about a week. Yeah. No, it's only been about two weeks since we met. Well, oh, it's been a total of three weeks, <laughs> and we're already this involved in city politics yeah. and everything. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, and especially the beginning where uh, not all the characters had been introduced to each other, so the party uh, wasn't moving together. Of um, course. There were yeah. segments of the party that were friends first. Yeah. And there was. Different mini, I don't, I don't know what to call them, mini like splinters of yeah, yeah that had their own 
adventuring at the same time. Exactly. So like, that's why yeah. that kind of happened yeah. in the beginning, at least. That's where, like, you'll see when we get into the actual session notes and everything. Uh, Pyre and Kava immediately hit it off, being the only dragonborns in the entire city. Yeah, and uh, and Skullier. Yep, Pyre and Skullier had this unique bond, both being uh, basically out there for the same reason, as far as sharing a lot of parallels. Yeah, and some stark differences. Yep, Shinira and Key had the entire. Uh, family being killed by the Court of Eyes thing to deal with, and yeah, I think it ended up playing out pretty well, all things considered. Yeah, everyone's got their uh, motivations. And yeah. Everyone, I think this party came together. It took a while for, for everyone to get on the same page, <laughs> yeah. but once we were there, we were there concretely. The moments where you guys acted as a team, it was pretty amazing how well you worked. Yeah. Like, during the Lich fight, for one, uh, when we get to that, that was, like, the first time you guys were actually together as a whole unit, aside from yeah. Key, who was waiting to ambush you on the way out. Yeah. But, um, yeah, like, actually seeing how your different characters work together in combat, especially, it was impressive. Yeah. Outside of combat, you guys are very much at odds with each other in many ways, but you've made it work so far. I mean, it kind of makes sense, though, because if you're in combat with someone, you'd rather uh, work with someone that you, you, you trust a little bit more than yeah. than undead uh, <laughs> skeletons and, and... You know, Phalanx may have had a uh, difficult time fitting in, but... Uh, it was one of the good yeah. fleshy skeletons, yeah, <laughs> eventually. <you know. laughs> um, yeah. The cool thing about the Lich, though, I want to say really quick, is is that was kind of, uh, um, from what I understand, a, a fight that you didn't expect to happen. An event that you didn't really expect. Sort of. I expected you guys to make it down there, see the Lich, and decide, oh, okay, we're not ready for this. Yeah, but we didn't. <laughs> no. And you weren't there that night, so Pyre especially was uh, feeling real into it as far as combat went. Yeah. Uh, we had... Paris controlling you, and she did a good job as a fighter for the first time that she's ever played it. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, she she put Pyre in there head first. Like, while everyone else was dealing with the minions and stuff, he was squaring off with a lich who was way out of his league. And that's, but that's the whole thing with, with Pyre, is, yeah. is that that's what he does in battles. Yeah. So it's it's actually fortuitous that she, she played the character that way. It was um, amazing. Because that's that's how he acts. Yep. He doesn't fight minions. He goes straight for the big guy. Exactly. Um, so that's actually perfect. And you ended up getting the opposite of a killing blow, but yeah. uh, slammed. Survived it in a spectacular way. Thanks so. to my uh, my strength against uh, yeah the fire resistance yeah. and everything. So yeah. yeah, yeah, it would have killed you otherwise. Yeah. Time to make a new character. Yeah, you know. <laughs> Pyro was fought for the uh, two sessions you got to play him. <laughs> yeah. Real uh, uh, red shirt there. Yeah. Yeah, I will say, before we actually get to that, I threw a lich at this party real early, yeah. specifically to show, okay, guys, it's all right to run away from uh, encounters if you have to. <laughs> but no. We were in what, level three? Yeah. Or were we four at that no, point? we were three. Three. Still three. <laughs> We started the campaign at level three. You didn't even have your full party yet. Yeah. This key was still waiting outside. One shy. Yeah, yeah, then we were weakened, and then there was another fight. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, that's going to be a fun episode, because I want, I want Paris to be here for that one. Yeah, 100%. that was her episode of 100%. the uh, campaign. But, uh, yeah. And, yeah, and we'll get to from that. there started the uh, distrust between, <laughs> between her and Byer for yeah, a little while. But now they're good. Yeah. That's what counts, right? There we go. You guys got there eventually. Uh, so yeah, as far as the city goes, as we just mentioned, there's a lich under it. Yeah. As every very, good uh, city yeah, has. You know, very minor, uh, just landmark within the city's graveyard. It's uh, it's pretty deep down there, though. It doesn't really bother the rest of the city. And uh, He likes music a lot. He likes music a lot. He's doing <laughs> his own thing down there. Yeah. 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 I'm sure not a threat to the city at all. He's chilling like a villain. Mm. Mm. Yep. <laughs> it's almost like if you guys hadn't gone down there, he would have no idea what was going on up top. And, uh, <laughs> some of the trouble you're in now might not have happened. Maybe. <laughs> Maybe. But yeah, we'll, we'll get there. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, the city itself, 
Uh, we'll have the map up on screen here. You, uh, you guys were pretty much just thrown into this from the moment that we started. I gave you guys the map of the city, told you a little bit about what was in each part of it, and basically just said, okay, for the first session... Go. We'll just go one <laughs> at a time. Tell me what you do for the first, like, hour you're in the city. Yeah. We, yep, and we kind of naturally gravitated, uh, three of us, <laughs> yeah. uh, straight to the, uh, the Salty Seaman. Right? Yeah, so that was entirely a joke name for, uh, I think Kava went first. And I was just listing off various uh, inns that were throughout the town. Couldn't think of a last one. I was like, uh, yeah, the one near the wharf. It's, uh, it's called yeah. the, the Salty Seaman. Which, which, which turned into... Immediately. <laughs> just, <laughs> yep, that's the one I go to. <laughs> yep. yep. And that kind of turned into a uh, what yeah. was basically supposed to be a nameless... Yeah, it was a nothing <laughs> inn that became your guys' headquarters. Yeah, that, that kind of became our HQ, yeah. As you all decided to uh, congregate there at the end of your first day in the city. Yep. Yeah, it was uh, it was a good time. That's when Pyre was very uh, <laughs> uh, anxious and uh -huh. chose to get a get a room in the basement where it's flooded. Yeah, you know, by the way. Yeah, with your big spider buddy. With a giant corner. spider buddy. Yeah. Ugh. Yeah. Oh man. It's those, fine though. <laughs> those first sessions were real, real special. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, you, you've got all the basics that you would want of a normal city. There's uh, the town square, which has all of your adventuring needs and everything. An artisan district that meets some of the the higher-end stuff you would need. Uh, enchanters, stuff along the lines of like blacksmiths and things. The waterfront was more just so you guys would get a view of the ship being there and you not being allowed on it. Um... The park is there. The resident district. If you guys had wanted to be more evil than you were, you could have like robbed some of the houses and stuff for supplies. I actually, <laughs> I actually have questions. Uh, oh yeah, for that stuff. So I don't talk about that too too much. Okay. And um, uh, yeah, then you had the uh, office district where the entire council, apart from one or two of them, live, which. Just to briefly touch on that, because it doesn't really play into the story until later on. Uh, the city is run by a council of, I think, ten individuals. And a... Good round number. Yeah, you know. And a representative of the Tenebrian Empire, as I mentioned in the intro. Which is just this real vague imperial force that's slowly conquering the whole continent. Uh, I didn't really give them much backstory in the beginning. The name itself literally just means Dark Empire. And it was supposed but, to be just something to kind of fill in the background while you guys were in the city for, like, the two sessions I expected this to last for. But they're not even really, um, like, evil, no, per se. No, They're just, that's just their name. Dark is strictly because they're led by a drow. Yeah. Yep. And, yeah. <laughs> but... Now they are, like, now that I've had to flesh it out and everything, they are a major faction within this continent, and basically a combination of, uh, I would say, probably, like, the Roman Empire and maybe Germany just before World War One. Oh, yes. That's a cool mix. Yeah. I it, like that. It worked out pretty well. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, they basically have influence all across the continent, Except for in a few little port cities here and there. Waterdeep's easily the biggest, that's a free city. Then you have uh, Port Daramir, which I'm sure you'll have more to say about. Yep. Uh, and then Tide Swallow, and a few other little ones here and there. But it was basically just the cities that helped uh, back when this country called Tenebrio, right in the very dead center of the continent, was. Uh, basically existing as nothing more than a slave state to every other major force around it. When they finally got their independence from all these other nations, it was these port cities and free states and everything that kind of sent aid their way. So once it developed into a major empire that was conquering the whole continent, they looked back on all those allies that they had back then and were just like, okay, yeah, you guys can stay free. You don't have to be part of the empire or anything. We won't bother you. You were helpful in the past. It's 
you know, it's just kind of spread from there. It, it kind of benefits them more to just allow them to yeah be their own entity exactly. uh, versus, you know, uh, assimilating them and holding back their potential. Yeah, it would basically be more trouble than it's worth and mm. wouldn't really gain them much of anything in the long run. If anything, it'd be higher. There'd yeah. be a lot of higher. Exactly. So yeah, that's pretty much all the Empire was. Uh, I think... And they got a very impressive uh, military presence. Yes, and uh, Tideswallow especially, there is a garrison right outside town. I'll show the bigger map of the whole region here in a minute. But um, it basically supports a pretty constant flow of troops in and out of the city. So they always have a presence here, but it's entirely just a... Yeah, we're just kind of watching the uh, the trade routes and everything coming in from the sea type presence. They're not, like, invading the city or anything yet. So, um, just really quick before um, we progress, I actually had a, some questions written down here for you. Oh, yeah. Um, unless you had anything else no, to go No, that should off be good. Uh, let me see. Uh, the first question would be, um, so what exactly was um, the influence of this. This, Right. So... For people that don't know. So, as you probably guessed if you're listening to this, uh, especially if you're watching this on YouTube, just from the channel name and everything, I am a big Lovecraft fan. Uh, Tide Swallow was basically just D&D Innsmouth. <laughs> there is, like, no way around that. This was... Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and some of the gods that exist I mean, in this. I mean, yeah, we'll, we'll get into it when yeah. we start the actual uh, session notes and everything, but there is a heavy, heavy eldritch side to all of all of everything that's going on here. Yeah. So, yeah, it's, um, we'll say heavily inspired by some Innsmith. Lovecraftian towns. Innsmouth front and center amongst them. Lovecraftian themes, yeah. eldritch, yeah. all kinds of fun stuff. Yeah, you know. Uh, <laughs> um, yeah. <laughs> so, what exactly was the, if you if you can, if you do know this, um, the population that you oh, had in mind? Right. Um, it said a couple times, being somewhere around like the, officially around 10,000 people living here. Mm -hmm. Once you get down into the lower districts, like the row and uh, the portions beneath the city, there's a lot of unaccounted for people down there. Yeah. Refugees, uh, there's an entire society of kobolds living under this because I had to throw in that. Just so we, th that seems like something that, uh, that we completely missed. A little bit. <laughs> uh, a lot of that, yeah. We saw some of it, but we didn't see it, a lot of it. I will say, when I set this up, I had written out a bunch of different plot hooks that you guys could have followed up on if you had wanted to or just skipped entirely yeah so that and, yeah that actually actually regarding the population i had a uh different direction for that yep. um demographic so what oh right. kind of races are here what what kind of town is this uh, so this is heavily uh humans dwarves some elves yeah some half elves that's the general population. So um, when two dragonborn show up, you guys and a were couple quite literally, aside from the two guards down in the silhouette's office down in the row, you guys were the only dragonborns in town. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> and then tieflings. Uh, they attracted a bit of attention too. <laughs> in the same party, eventually. Alistair and Melody were very much trying to stay uh, off the radar when they first arrived. Yeah. And then they met you guys, and that became harder and harder as time went on. Yeah, we like to make noise. So. Uh -huh. um, <laughs> <laughs> um, so, you mentioned briefly that there's like a whole uh, network underground of yeah. kobolds. Yep. Uh, just wondering if, if there's any areas that um, that we missed, that we didn't explore, <laughs> uh, things that you're kind of, not necessarily disappointed, but you wish that we had um Scene. There were a few. Uh, the few times you guys went into the row, you definitely didn't stay there long. There was what is essentially a whole undercity down there. Much more rickety kind of shanty town, essentially. But it 
it's extensive, and it goes to some interesting places if you wanted to follow up on it. I remember you initially gave me a thread to go down there. Yeah, so there were... I'm trying to think. Because you had one, Skaldir had one. Shanira had the connection to Key that she could have followed up on. Yeah. Um, I'm trying to think. Do you remember what yours was specifically? Uh, it was basically just because I snuck into the city on the southern wall. And I ended up in the row. Right. And there was there was yes. a noise or some kind of uh, energy emitting from... So that one was actually very much the lich under the cemetery. Okay. Uh, you could have accidentally found your way down there if you had wanted to. Oh, zoinks. Yeah. That, <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, that could have been a real interesting way to go about uh, that first day in the city. But, um... I think what else? Because there was. Yeah, oh, I turned right. away from that. I was like, yeah, yeah you I turned don't away know. from that. Then you ended up in a jail cell down there eventually yeah. with the Sunless. But uh, That was fun. Yeah. Those were basically your two connections to it. I tried to give everyone a possible reason to go down there, but some of it was just kind of ignored. Some of it, there were better things to do. Uh, besides the road. Sometimes because... we had you know, pressing matters as well. Oh, absolutely. So certain things <laughs> that were like time specific. Yep. Uh, besides the row, there was the entirety of the residential district you guys just never even bothered with. <laughs> um, yeah. Which, honestly, isn't much of an issue. It was more, if you wanted to be more of an evil party, uh, you could have yeah. messed that place up a bit. <laughs> but um, yeah, When I had mentioned that I had questions, that, that's, that's... I was curious about that. What kind of evil... There would have been a lot of burglary, um, potential... Hobo killing... You know, <laughs> specifically, there was an item that you guys picked up at one point and never really thought about again afterwards. There was a contract that a summoner that you guys fought had on him. Uh, when you pick it up, because of the wording, the contract that he had made passes to whoever is now holding it hmm. until they die. And the influence from it could push you towards doing certain things to be rewarded. And some of those things may have taken place in the residential district and been very much against your initial nature, let's say. Huh. Yeah. But So is it like, is it uh, enchanted or... There's some kind of demonic or infernal or devil-based enchantment Corruptive. on it. And it basically puts you in contact with a agent from one of the Nine Hells. Okay. And uh, he offers you some stuff to do some jobs. Uh, do the Nine Hells kind of follow the idea of uh, uh, the, 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 what are they called in, in Sins? The oh, like and... the, uh, like the Circles of Hell from, uh, yeah. yeah, from Dante's Inferno, not so much no kind of there this one's actually just straight from D. &D. i didn't have to change yeah. anything no like i knew or anything i played a little bit of neverwinter so oh, i okay, already yeah. knew a little bit about that yeah uh, essentially each one's ruled by a different uh oh, i always get this part wrong i'm pretty Prince. sure they're devils not yeah. demons or fiends but um yeah there's a heavy heavy uh focus on making deals and stuff like that so each level has a different theme to it, essentially, we'll say. Um, doesn't necessarily go along with the... Deadly Sins. Yeah, the Deadly Sins, but there's there's parallels. Yeah, I mean, I mean, yeah. the Deadly Sins are such a basic uh, exactly. concept, you know? Exactly, yeah. So it's kind of hard not to. Yeah, I think I blew that up a bit. No, I, just, I was just trying to read with that one. Yep. Um, yeah, beyond that, uh, there was some stuff going on in the waterfront that may still happen, so I don't want to give too much of that away. Yeah, that was actually, uh, kind of leads yeah. <laughs> leads a little bit into another question that I had about um, if there's any, hmm, <laughs> I don't know if I should be talking about this in episode one. That's fine. <laughs> no, it's it's way, way okay. later. Alright. Um, yeah, save that one for uh, the other question. Down the, line. the other question I had was, "What happened to the captain?" And who knows? <laughs> who knows? 
I've got a bunch of possible fates in line for the captain. Uh, he was a piece of shit. Mm-hmm. He may have been killed by the court. You right. guys may have inadvertently killed him at some point. True. He, he could have been a part of the He might still be in the city right now. <laughs> you don't know. Uh, I was thinking he might just be on a bender. That was a <laughs> very real possibility for a while there, and that was going to be my explanation if the original DM showed back up and was like, all right, we're going to start. I'd just be like, okay, yep, uh, he showed back up on the ship last night, uh, drunk as Miserable. all hell. <laughs> In pain. Yep. Um, Not really sure where he had been all that time either. It's uh, it's weird. He's got like amnesia or something. Yeah. Um, and kind of bouncing off the area that we missed question. Yeah. Uh, bouncing back to that a little bit. Um, similarly, is there an activity that we missed? <laughs> a bunch. A lot. A Anything lot. in particular that uh, um, that you kind of wish that we had? I'm trying to think of ones that I actually did want to see you guys interact with. Uh, you never once talked to two of the lords of the city that you could have. Yeah. Um, the dwarven master of forges and uh, smithing and all that stuff. Mm-hmm. Never visited his uh, mine or quarry or whatever it is just outside the city. Uh, there was definitely some stuff going on out there that would have led to a almost darkest dungeon-like area deep down. Really? That has potentially been influencing some of this stuff. Huh. Um, I will say by the time we get back to regular sessions now, that stuff will have already come to pass. So when you guys make it back to Tide Swallow next week or whenever... If. If you guys make <laughs> it back to Tide Swallow next week, don't expect that to be an option on the table anymore. Damn. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds cool. That yeah, sounds interesting. Uh, it, it was... It was fun to design. An Elseworld story where we, yeah, we <laughs> did that. I mean, there <laughs> might be an opportunity for it. Um, um, yeah. So I guess that kind of answers the other question that I had, which was if there's any characters that you specifically wish that we had in right <laughs> So, all right, so just right off the bat, you know I'm a big Critical Role fan and everything. Right, 100%. Uh, there was a shopkeeper in here heavily based off a joke character that they used in the second campaign of Critical Role that I absolutely adored. And, um... You guys never visited her shop? (laughs) And I feel real bad about it, because... Oh boy, was that going to be an interesting one. It was a, uh... No, actually, since the shop's been destroyed by the point that we're at in the story. Oh, no. Yeah. <laughs> no. That whole section of town is just wiped out. Yeah. Um, the map you're looking at, it, it looks different. <laughs> it's been at changed a bit by... The point uh, that we're at yeah. in the campaign. <laughs> Some things have come to pass. Time um, has passed. <laughs> there was a potion and herbs dealer who was presented as just this deformed little old lady in you know, a hooded cloak. Oh, I know what this is. With their, yeah. Yeah, I think yeah. I mentioned this to yeah. you specifically. Yeah, you showed me the picture. Uh, <laughs> and she would have sent you guys on a interesting mission into the woods to get her something. Uh, the woman in question is actually just three kobolds in a cloak. You and your kobolds, man. I love kobolds. <laughs> Uh, so yeah, you never interacted with her. I had some other shopkeepers that would have been fun for you guys to uh, start up an actual relationship with in any way, and it would have made some stuff when you were dealing with the court later on much more personal, let's say. It's kind of funny how much we actually, rather than going to like a lot of these more useful areas, we yeah. ended up going to the junk shop. Oh lot. yeah, you spent a lot of time at <laughs> the junk shop. And to be fair, he was one of the cultists at that last ritual. Oh, uh, yeah? Skullier recognized him. Oh, okay. No one else did, since he was pretty much the only one that spent a lot of time in the junk shop. He got the sweet, um... The crocodile yeah, on his shoulder. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I need to give him some opportunities to use that thing yeah, soon. It's pretty cool. <laughs> uh, but yeah, uh, basically if you had formed actual connections with any of these shopkeepers or tavern owners or anything like that, uh, since the Court of Eyes is an organization that basically pulls its sacrifices from the general public, 
there was a very real chance that you would have recognized some of the people either A, being sacrificed, or B, doing the sacrifices. Cultists. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, speaking of sacrifices by the court, yes. Um, they they mainly focus on who as as sacrifices people that people who will not be missed. Yeah. So Outsiders, disenfranchised most types or disenfranchised the poor, the poor anyone who is just outside of adventurers. Yeah, basically anyone outside of the general populace's like real focus. But sometimes they get desperate and just grab random shopkeepers, too. Um, yeah. But yeah, the whole idea behind a good portion of it was you guys were all potential targets. If you had fallen asleep in the wrong place, if you had separated for too long, there was a very real chance that anyone not born and raised in the city, Wait. or Shanira, because she was a previous... Actually, no, any of you, because if they'd found out who Key was, they would have tried to get her, too. Yeah. Uh, yeah, any of you are people who would not have been missed. We could have been chosen. Eh, you had one big opportunity to uh, even use yourselves as bait at one point, too. Yeah. But, um... I don't know about that. You, you found a better <laughs> way around that. Uh, yeah, but, um, that, that's pretty much who they go for. They're not too picky with who the people are, as long as they're pretty sure no one's going to come looking for them or anything. Yeah. yeah. Now, you briefly mentioned uh, Shanira uh, being from the the only character in the party from Tide Swallow. Yes. However, Alistair ha has been there for a period of time as well. He was there for about three days before the rest of the party arrived. Okay. So, I have an extensive journal written for him. Yeah, you mentioned that the other night. I would show it to you, except that unlike what I expected, he's still somehow alive. <laughs> so, he's gonna hang on to that journal. Probably got some spoilers Oh, in there, some right? big ones. Yeah. You guys can essentially pickpocket off him if you ever want to. Shanira's done it once. Let me check what my... <laughs> Uh, and got a few pages out of it of backstory. He got one page of backstory. Right. Um, but yeah, it is a good 70 pages of stuff that I've just written in my spare time to kind of flesh out the character as having kept an actual journal. Yeah, and realistically yeah. frame it. Yeah, so actually... He writes a lot, though. He doesn't even <laughs> just write that. He writes novels, too, right? I guess since we kind of skipped over it, I'll go into... Uh, so it's going to be my actual player character mm -hmm. when we started. Right. Uh, his name was originally Zanktis Shadefang, which or is a character. Is. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Dude, I played around with a lot of aliases for this guy yeah. while we were going into it, just because I had my physical character sheet still sitting around with Zanktis Shadefang written on the top and all his stats there. Didn't you name a character in a game that we played together, Zanktus, as well? Probably, Don't yeah. remember what. It might have been Dark Souls or something. It's a character from a book that I'm writing. Yeah. And nothing to do oh, with the character here, but it is a, it's a name that I reuse a lot. You know what would be funny is if, if he were a character who introduces himself under a different name Every to time. every group that he interacts with. So that was actually Matt's idea for his character yeah. until he settled on one really good alias to go with. Rob Steele? Uh, no, that's his actual name. Oh. <laughs> he went with the uh, obvious alias. If we scroll up here. Odd V is alias. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't even notice yeah. that. That's perfect. Well, he said it real fast when he... Uh, uh, so our other friend Matt showed up for two sessions just partway through and played a wizard anime style uh, suited gentleman thief. Fun character. Great character. Life got in the way almost immediately and he couldn't keep yeah. playing unfortunately. Yeah. I'm trying to uh, get him back at some point but it hasn't quite panned out just yet. Yeah. Um, but yeah basically when I realized I wouldn't actually get to play Alistair, I wanted to kind of hide who the character was that I was introducing as an NPC, and I essentially just had him be this 
random tiefling that's occasionally in the background at the bar mm -hmm. with his daughter. I remember while, that actually when we yeah. were at the bar and uh, and you were telling you were describing the people that yeah. were sitting at tables. I tried to very quickly go through a bunch of different people and work him into the middle somewhere so he wouldn't stand out as much. We were kind of like two tieflings. Yeah, how about that? <laughs> I know I kind of dodged the uh, the question any time it came up. Like, wait, what was that before the group of gnomes? <laughs> uh, just someone. What, what about before the or after the dwarf yeah. that's uh, asleep at the uh, at the bar? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> uh, but yeah, you you guys did eventually actually like introduce yourselves and everything. You uh, stalked his daughter for a while until she went out to get him and introduce you. It, it, it was it's a, a lot less thing. creepy than it sounds. Oh yeah, no, it was way more innocent than I'm purposely <laughs> making it sound right now. Yeah, wait until never mind. Yeah, uh, yeah, uh, but yeah, he I had set him up as a warlock of this uh, eldritch abomination called Siphon or Siphon or however you pronounce it. Some and people have said Kaiphon. Yeah, you said Siphon. It's mostly. been all over the place, which makes sense for something of that nature. It's like, oh yeah, it's it's Un unpronounceable, unknowable. Yeah, under, uh, you know, probably to not even his real being. name. That's just yeah. how we hear it. Uh, but yeah, then I wanted him to appear to just be an ordinary NPC, so I gave him this uh, alias of Alistair Verse, and I named his daughter Melody Shadefang. And the little raven familiar that he carries around was just called Chorus. So it was basically just him coming up with a bunch of music-related things on the spot when asked for a name. I never, I never noticed yeah. that. That's cool. And then Alistair. It was originally going to be Alistair just because it's the tiefling. made immediately think of demonology, so Alistair Crowley and everything. Mm, yeah, I picked up on that. But then uh, Hasbin Hotel was about to come out just a few weeks later... And one of the characters in that is just named Alistor, spelled the way I spell it here, and he's the best. <laughs> and I just had to use that name. Yeah, sometimes uh, you have to. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, he was essentially just supposed to appear as this writer who is going to the New World in search of uh, inspiration for a story, similar to how Cobb is going in search of inspiration for a song. And then you guys start digging a little deeper and asking more questions and bringing him along on dangerous situations where he had to slowly let it kind of come out that, oh yeah, just just a ordinary writer wandering around who can also fire violet blasts of energy out of his cane and control people's minds and unleash horrors on people that terrify them but no one else can see. Um... So where did you where'd you get the idea for, for Alistair? You mentioned he's from another story of yours. The name at least. The name is Thanks. totally unrelated. It's just You just picked the name and Just then... a name. Okay. It's just like oh that'll be fun to just have that name in here. The character himself was supposed to be my take on essentially a, a gunslinger. Yeah. But based around books instead of revolvers. I mean, yeah, imagine. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, he was very much a writer like he pretends to be and everything. Uh, you guys eventually found some of his books just lying around in a library somewhere. Yeah. Um, I believe Key read some of Yeah, Key read some of the uh, uh, more saucy novels that yeah, he's put out. That's the word, yeah. I, I've, <laughs> I was trying to think how to represent that, and I ended up actually printing out a few little booklets that I unfortunately don't have with me right now. But instead of actually having the story written in them... What's written is the character's reaction to reading what's written in the story, essentially. <laughs> <Just> like, <laughs> that's cool. Yeah, I, that's, that's cool. That's just because I didn't want to actually think up anything for them. It was more... So that's why uh, she was acting. Yeah. yeah that's cool. Yeah. Uh, it was fun. Wow. Uh, that's cool. And then there was one other... Or no, two other books that Shanira also found in that same library that were by him that were not poorly written romance novels. So he's a, he's a known author. Yes. Uh, he has been around for a while, let's say. And the alias of Alistair Verse has been around at least a good 50 years as a writer. 
Then there's about a dozen other names that go back even further than that that he's gone by. So that's something of a... Uh, uh, what did um, what did Stephen King name himself for Running Man? What did he? S- oh, I forgot about that. Um, what's the word for that? Shit. I was gonna know this. <laughs> um, is that a? It's a pen name, but there's another word for it. Yeah. Um, the pseudonym. Pseudonym. Yeah, I think it was pseudonym. Yeah, yeah, because he was Richard Bachman or something. Yeah, yeah, that was he has a couple though, right? Yeah, he has I more think than so. That. Yeah, that's so. That's sort of what what Al, uh, yeah. what what Zank It's pretty does. much the same idea. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. So like in reality, he is, or not in reality, the life he has set up for himself and everything. He he's an archivist that works for this magic college in um, Waterdeep, and he just kind of writes this stuff in his spare time when he's not working there or going out on assignment. In reality, behind that, he's a warlock of this unearthly god, Siphon, who is basically using this cover as a reason to go around and answer prayers that people are making to this eldritch violet star that they're wishing on. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, it basically just sends out one of its emissaries to kind of answer people's desperate pleads for help. And usually um, they go all right. So from what I understand, in terms of that god, uh, Siphon, yeah, um, it's a god who there isn't a lot of uh, a lot of actual tangible information. Yeah, on that so, character. So what was that like? <laughs> it was fun. Yeah, I got to essentially design my own patron. Yeah, um, it was basically just something I'd written into his backstory already that he was worshiping this god that demanded knowledge rather than something more outright evil or anything like sacrifice that. Sacrifice. Yeah. Or... There's no demands for sacrifice, no call to do anything particularly evil. It just wanted knowledge. And you're left to interpret that however you want as one of its followers. Now when I looked up Siphon, I did see one interesting bit of lore where uh, the, the god can give its uh, its... <laughs> Followers the ability to create a like a pathway, like a, yeah. a stairway, and it can drive someone insane. It's a uh, it's a unique ability. Yeah, I think I had Alistair utilize it once so far, and only for a moment. He was yeah. just moving from a very specific spot to another very specific spot. Mm-hmm. I always interpreted that spell as having a pretty immediate effect on the mind when you use it. Right. Unless you're really used to the effects of it. So, since he is hundreds of years old, I figure, alright, he's used it enough that maybe it doesn't have as big an impact anymore. He has, like, a tolerance. Yeah, kind of builds it up. And then you start looking through his journal, and in between the totally normal, sane entries, there's just, in completely different colors and handwriting, all these other ramblings that make no sense, and Even a couple times, entries right after where he's trying to figure out what he can do about that to stop just blacking out writing this stuff and doing who knows what else in the meantime. Yeah. Uh, But yeah, it's... uh, There are some definite downsides to worshipping a great old one. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. As there would be. (laughs) Yeah, you know. Insanity and all that. But yeah. Um, And he's he's a really interesting character because you transition him from being... What was going to be your your playable character? Just a little level three warlock with eighteen hit points. Yeah. And to uh, suddenly he was extremely powerful and yeah and uh, central to the plot. Of course, there may have been a certain shift somewhere along the line where I decided, all right, the new world campaign's never happening. Might as well just bump him up to level twenty. Level twenty. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Just to show off. Yeah. Uh, you know. What you can do. This is what a full-fledged adventurer at level 20 can do. This is something for you guys to aim for. This is something for you guys to die to if you decide to take a certain path toward the end of the campaign. And, yeah, you know, one thing led to another, and you guys managed to keep him around. Yep. And alive. (laughs) Yeah. Because he could have very much died in multiple uh, 
combat encounters that you guys have gotten into with them. See, that's a that's an interesting thing with D and D. Um, whereas in you know, if you're playing a video game, you get a game over screen and you go back to a checkpoint. Yeah, your character's yeah. fine. D and D, you're dead. Usually, you're dead. Yeah, <laughs> and it's time to make a new character. Yep, unless someone has a pretty definite way of reviving you, either right then and there. Or if you have a cleric, which you guys no longer do, uh, you could uh, potentially keep someone's remains able to be revived indefinitely, mm -hmm. but you would still need a pretty expensive spell to bring them back. Yeah. I kind of like the way that uh, Darkest Dungeon did it, where you could bring back the character, but they would never grow yeah, they stronger. Were, they were right? stuck like that. It's almost like a piece of them would be yeah. missing, you know? Exactly. So, that's how I would imagine that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I don't know. Alistair has just been a really fun character to work with. And when, so, sorry to interrupt, but yeah, no. um, when you did switch him to being an NPC, yep. um, what changes did you make fundamentally, if any, to his, his personality, to his background? personality and background stayed essentially exactly the same. Right. There was just more of a focus on hiding his power. Mm -hmm. uh, I tried to make it so he was only casting first level spells or cantrips until somewhere along the line, I think I think the fight that Matt showed up for and everything, uh, one of the some of the Court of Eyes members started directly targeting Melody just because I had put her in a bad spot. Exposed location. Some of the stuff had shifted from where I thought it was going to, uh, and she became the primary target, and he had to kind of let a little more of it show through to uh, get her out of that situation. Which is an interesting way to show, to hint, yeah. his, his actual power. There, there might be a little more there yeah. than what you've been seeing, because, yeah. I don't know, it seemed like a good narrative beat to go with, and uh, I, I've i never liked the idea of DM PCs just because, like, you're supposed to be leading the group through the game. It's not supposed to be about you and your character. It's you're, supposed you're, to be about the players. You're the narrator. Yeah. Basically. Yeah. So I tried to keep him as in the background as I possibly could, and... So far, I think it worked out pretty well. He's yeah. been pretty hands-off with most of what's happened. Mm -hmm. Just kind of been like a guiding force more than anything else if needed. He's, he's actively been missing from certain scenarios. Yeah, I've made sure he hasn't been in certain ones. <laughs> and uh, especially right now while you guys are in uh, Waterdeep, that is yours to explore. Yeah. He's off doing something totally different right now that will... You guys will see the outcome of it pretty soon. But it's supposed to be removing him from the picture for the time being. His his involvement, in a way, kind of reminds me. You played uh, Dragon Age Origins, right? Oh yeah. yeah. Remember Duncan? Yeah. It's like Duncan, except for he never died. Exactly. Like he's still there to kind of guide us. Yeah. And, and show us. And that's just it. I always love the trope of like the older, experienced veteran leading uh, the new group of heroes through stuff. Yeah. And then they die. Yeah. But that's kind of... I always, always kind of wondered, like, what would happen if they just kind of stuck around? Yeah, I was going to say that's kind of typical, though. Yeah. Like, in all of Bioware's games, there's always... Oh, yeah. A, ...a mentor character, and they die. Yep. Like, there's only one... What's well, time that didn't happen? Like, Lord of the Rings is the one big one I think of where they kind of subvert that in terms of, yep, mentor character's dead. Nope. Oh, no, wait. Here he comes. Back in the next book. <laughs> yeah. He's uh, lighter. Yeah. yeah. It's more powerful than ever. <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah. Uh, but even then, they still managed to remove him from the important scenes and everything mm -hmm. and have him just play a background role. And he comes in and yeah. saves the day. Yeah, he does a couple badass things here and there where it would have been impossible for other characters to solve the situation, let's say. I try to not present you with any any problems that can't be solved by the group mm -hmm. in one way or another. But Alistair's technically there to get you guys out of something that you may get yourselves in way over your heads if it comes down to it. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, 
I've always seen drawn to uh, the warlock characters in, in a lot of things. <laughs> Such a fun class. Yeah. That's uh, tieflings are like my go-to as far as the actual race that I play usually, and then warlock just goes along so well with them that I couldn't help but make it one. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, the actual warlock class is like as interesting as the game gets just because of how yeah it's really cool how versatile it is how much customization you get and everything I think if I had made a spellcaster I might have made him a warlock it's a good way to go yeah but even even as far as uh, Zanktis is a, a warlock he's not entirely a warlock either he's got a few levels in fighter right? yeah so uh, when you guys witnessed your future selves having a fight with him which we'll get to that later. still <laughs> sounds weird to say yeah um, he did a few things that you would clearly recognize as fighter yeah. techniques, mm -hmm. uh, specifically the extra action and everything, the, uh, I think it's called Action Surge. Action um, Surge, yeah, that's amazing. Yeah, some just fighting styles and stuff. He has, uh, I think it's like dueling or something like that where he can essentially add an additional amount to his AC to parry attacks. Mm -hmm. Um... Yeah, he, uh, he has, I think, three levels of fighter in there just to get him a few basic things to make him a little more yeah. survivable. Fighter's one of those classes that the first few levels are actually really beneficial. Oh, yeah. And you Very can, beneficial. You can virtually work him into any other class, and it's yeah. a good way of going. I mean, that's kind of the whole point of fighter. Is yeah. it's, they're, they're supposed to be generic but strong, yep. you know? And honestly, I didn't feel too bad missing out on the final... Uh, big feature of Warlocks that you get at level 20, just because it wouldn't really play into this campaign at all, the way I had Alistair set up the way as you a see companion. The yeah. Yeah. yeah, so it seemed like a good way to go. Yeah, that's why I might end up multi-classing a bit. Um, I could totally see Pirate taking up some spell casting of some kind. Opposite of uh, maybe Warlock, you know? Yeah. We'll see. Yeah. We'll see where that goes. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, so, let me think. <clears throat> uh, yeah, so that was Alistair, and then Melody is basically just set up as his adopted daughter that he is taking around because he didn't want to just leave her alone by herself like she's usually left when he goes out on the smaller jobs that he has to do that take him away for like a week or so at a time. I was going to say, that's an interesting dynamic. Yeah. Um... Basically, since he knew he might not come back at all from the New World, he's like, all right, might as well just bring her with me, set her up somewhere safe out there, but somewhere I can always check in on her, that sort of thing. Yeah, teach her on the way. Exactly. Try to... Uh, Pass on the torch. Yeah. If need be. And I don't feel bad spoiling it at this point, since Key's already seen it. She is far from the first one of these that he has taken on. He has a habit of since he's lived so long, finding a protege. Rescues, basically. Pretty much looks, <laughs> looks for orphans and gives them yeah. a better life, but only ever one at a time. Like, yeah. he's clearly not doing it out of charity, because otherwise he would take in a bunch of kids and give them all better lives. It's more either out of guilt and making up for something in his past, or specifically out of greed and wanting to have someone else there to teach all this stuff to having so it doesn't someone. just die yeah. with him. It's kind of an extension of himself and his legs yeah. if he were to die. I wanted to think of it's almost like a much less moral uh, Batman situation yeah. with Robin and everything like that. Yeah, because they, they, you know, they always say that you live as long as people remember you. Exactly. So I could see him trying to pass on the legacy that, yeah. that he has. The weird thing is though He's got an extended life span just because of his work with, like, directly working with a great old one. Yeah. The kids he takes in do not. I was going to say, so, the, 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 he, I, I, th I think when I was looking at the lore for Tieflings, it's only, it's they a live human. about as long as humans. Yeah, it's, you're a normal human, you just look a little different. Yeah. And you can do weird things with your you eyes and cooler, fire, actually. Yeah. But. Yeah. <laughs> but you were saying... But yeah, you were essentially just a normal human, other than that. Um, he ended up meeting what would have been his 
son that he had adopted a while back, mm-hmm. who is now like a early fifty year old man working for the college. Wow. And keeps in touch with Alistair, is grateful for everything he's done, but has clearly gone a slightly separate way. His own way. Yeah, he's not involved with Alistair's religion, let's call it, <laughs> and uh, is basically just checks in now and then to make sure everything's alright, but other than that is totally a separate character. And there have been others. And we will leave it at that as far we as might, that goes. We might meet them someday. Yeah, we'll see. Uh, but yeah, Melody was very much supposed to be, um, I've always kind of loved the, the dynamic of, like, uh, I'm trying to think of what a good example would be. It, it comes up a lot in westerns, it comes up a lot in samurai stories, of the grizzled, old, like, almost at the end of his life, warrior. Like Logan. Yes, actually, Logan is a perfect example. Yeah. Taking in this kid who is also very much down on their luck and mirroring the the older warrior in a lot of ways. And the mentor sees the opportunity to... Yeah. 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 Logan from the movie Logan. That's exactly it. Logan out of Logan. <laughs> yeah. Good movie. It's a, it's a fun dynamic, and yeah. Melody has been a ton of fun to play as, and she's just this innocent. polite, innocent, like, little demon angel of a girl. Yeah. And then combat breaks out, and she is right in the front lines yeah. with a bunch of uh, Blood Hunter stuff that I never actually fully learned how to play as, because mm-hmm. she was going to be my replacement if Alistair died. Right. And, uh, yeah, it would have been a totally different play style that I was going to learn on the fly then. And then I had to learn it a little quicker since you guys decided to bring her <laughs> in a battle against the Lich. Yeah. So, uh, the, yeah. Uh, that, that's, and that's a good idea, is that you can take characters from your background. Of, oh, yeah. Or your immediate story, in this case. Yep. And, and kind of turn them into one of your play, player characters and if you need to. When we started this, I had four different characters I was considering playing. Yeah. And the ones that didn't make the cut were essentially just waiting to join in if the other ones died. Yeah. So. I mean, I got a few lined up. Yeah. Still. Yeah. (laughs) It's, uh... It's a good way to play just to have it in the background just because, like, it's better to think of death as an opportunity in this to try something new. Tell a new story. Rather than... Try a new uh, class. Yeah. It shouldn't be looked at as like, all right, well, I'm just done. Oh, right. fuck, there goes my character. Yep. Yep, they ruined everything that I worked for. It's going to be yeah. harder than Dark Souls. Uh-huh. Yeah. Yeah, so. Um, <laughs> that's that's my characters. <laughs> yeah. 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 Anything else on that topic, or was that pretty much it for the, uh, the questions? Did you want to talk about Melody's nature, like nature? Uh... Yeah, might as well. Yeah. So, in the picture that's going to be on screen and everything, she has the appearance of a little tiefling girl. And that is how she was presented for most of the beginning of the campaign. Uh, that's just, again, because I love tieflings and usually end up playing as them. That's such a cool picture. Yeah. The, I, I'm going to have to put the artist in here. I think it was... Ice... Seven Ice Art or something yeah. like that. I'll, I'll get the She's actual. She's got an Instagram. I, yeah. I would suggest following her if you have Instagram. It's such an amazing job. With she just, does commissions. And, fast, too. And it's decently priced, and they're mm-hmm. great, as you can see. Yeah. Uh, yeah, basically, she was meant to just be a tiefling at first, and then, uh, what was one of the books that came out right in the middle of the campaign introduced the official playable changeling race. Right. And I realized, oh, I hadn't really fleshed out Melody that much in the actual campaign. Mm -hmm. Like, I had a bunch of background stuff I had written, but none of it really had to change if I were to say that, oh yeah, she was a changeling the whole time. Yeah. And it actually explained a few inconsistencies that I had accidentally made throughout the course of talking about her in-game. So... It all ended up working out. She ended up uh, getting a slightly different design by the end of it. Uh, when I 
think during a fight with the court, she got knocked unconscious and reverted back to her normal form. Yep. And, uh, yeah. There was also some fun stuff that was going to happen with her being a blood hunter. She was going to uh, subclass into the Path of the Lycan and was going to be able to transform into this yeah, big, I awesome that. wolf. Yeah. Uh, but I'm taking her in a different direction now as a character, so okay. that might never happen. We'll see. Now, who... Someone from Reddit did this one? Yeah, so this one... No, actually, this... I think this was another commission. I oh, actually what? gotten it done for another person who was playing in a... Uh, there was a text-based campaign that I had done for a little while, mm -hmm. and they needed an idea for a character, so I basically just gave them the idea for Melody. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, that was pretty much just uh, but, what the art got made for originally. You, you did have, uh, like, an immense amount of luck with uh, uh, Reddit. Uh, yeah. What so was that subreddit? The entire subreddit of, um, I think it's just our character drawing has been amazing for... Very fast turnaround. Yeah. Um, actually, the picture that I used for the icon for this series, the one of the big centipede snake thing, uh, that was all, all done by an artist on um, this subreddit who... Uh, the Reddit is just based around taking ideas for characters, having artists draw them for free, and post them as basically examples of what they're capable of doing. December 9th, 8th. <laughs> yeah, so uh, uh. <laughs> the the big serpent centipede was supposed to be the final boss of um, this campaign and ended up only actually getting introduced into it a few weeks ago. Yeah. Uh, I got yeah. the art done for it back in December. <laughs> I was going to say, I thought there was a fast turnaround on this one, but this was done forever. <laughs> oh, yeah. Ago. No, this one was... It was a fast turnaround. Yeah. This was done just a few days after I posted it. But, yeah, it's been a while uh, uh, just waiting to get used. Yeah. <laughs> but, yeah. Go check out that subreddit. It's amazing. Very cool. There's a lot of cool artwork. You got one of Phalanx done, too. Yep. Oh, yeah. I totally forgot about that one. Uh, yeah, so that was when we were still trying to get... A definite idea of what phalanx looked like I basically put up a vague description and someone came through with an amazing just incredible I don't have it saved here anymore oh, I will really? have it on screen while I'm saying this just it's post. really cool though it's well yeah. done amazing uh, depiction of this uh, skeleton cleric of Kelimvor yeah it's great it's great. Um, and then, um... Yeah. <laughs> and then Kiki. Oh, yeah. And... and what then, became known as Kiki. What became known as Kiki. <laughs> uh, so what you are seeing now is the <laughs> human version of... Uh, human in big quotation marks. Question mark, question mark, question mark. Version <laughs> of that centipede snake thing that you saw earlier. Because this group makes some interesting decisions when given access to the wish spell. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, uh, yeah. Those are, uh, those are some examples of the characters I come up with, which I guess is what this episode ended up being. Yeah. <laughs> uh, fun stuff. Oh man, I am never going to get used to that. Yeah. That's true. And you guys probably never will. <laughs>